Okay, so we're just going to dive right in. We're going to pull back a little bit just here. That's oh, you tweaked with these slides. Okay, let me hand this over to you. Uh, I just put this slide in. Understand that uh, Eduardo and I were in separate cities and we kind of coordinated and I just threw in this slide. This is my favorite slide uh, just to introduce this and I've basically introduced it to you folks already. Uh, you know, major misconception, opioids are the problem and essentially what we're talking about and what we uh, touched upon is, is that we actually have an addiction problem. And so the reason I mention those diseases of despair is because the life expectancy after 30 years of improvement only in the United States has dropped over the last two years. And the decline is related specifically to these drugs and diseases of despair. And that is drug dependence, mostly opioids, alcohol dependency, and suicide. And so why is it so prominent now? The theories from these two economists, uh, these Princeton economists are that these are adverse social determinants. The World Health Organization, when they discuss what people face uh, as far as how it affects their health, um, they coined that term, social determinants. And these are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and then age. And so the theory is, is that long-term declines in education, employment, wages, childhood trauma, marriage decline, concurrent mental illness, and loss of connection with others, a very important one, leads to this hopelessness and what they call a cumulative disadvantage. You know, wealthy people have a social capital network. They have uncles and aunts and fathers and mothers that can advise them on finances and what to do, wrong decisions, where they went wrong. And these folks don't have that. Um, and so when individuals feel helpless, they're more likely to engage in these risky behaviors such as excessive alcohol, substance abuse, violence towards themselves or others. Um, and they also forego necessary health care. So, you know, that's really the issue that we face as a collective group of healthcare professionals looking to improve this situation. I'm going to rave about MAT because I'm very passionate about it, um, but I just want to keep this in the background and it's extraordinarily important that we not forget that, you know, if we're not working as policy professionals and changing laws to diminish the uh, associated penalties with drug use, and to diminish the laws that prevent harm reduction strategies to be taught, like safe needle exchange sites, um, then we're kind of at a loss uh, and, and we're really kind of taking a few steps forward and some steps back, so go yeah, ahead. Yeah, and I, I didn't know Mark put this slide in here. Um, my role as a director of behavioral health for the Department of Humanities, Health and Society at the medical school at Florida National University really deals with social determinants of health in a household-based program. So I'm really glad that this was brought up. And also in, in earlier talks when we talked about, okay, we, maybe the funding is for this, but the problem is, is this, and how do we, how do, we do that? And I, I think what we're finding in the work with social determinants of health, and what has already been established is that 90% of the reasons for premature death have nothing to do with medical care. It's all the social determinants of health stuff. So, and if you add quality of life, which the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation did, it's 80% of, of, of health outcomes are due to social determinants of health and not medical related. So it, it, it is really tough when you have kind of one hand tied behind your back and you're not able to address some of these things. I was very um, excited to see that you guys are collecting data on, on housing. I think that it's super important, a very fundamental social determinant of health. And, and, uh, and other social determinants of health, um, but yeah, they're, they're very difficult to address. So I don't want to you know, take us too far off on a tangent. We're just going to start by briefly re reviewing treatment in general, and then we're going to focus more on, on medication treatment, and, and we're going to end briefly on some of the behavioral techniques that, that are more evidence-based and a lot of you are probably using in your programs. Um, so this is NIDA's 13 principles. We're just going to quickly go over these. I'm curious to, to see if, 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 if there's some discussion around these, if you guys are okay with these. When I present these to some audiences, some of them are, are somewhat, might be new or controversial. Um, so we'll just go through them. So I think we've all established that no single uh, treatment is effective. Even amongst uh, behavioral therapies or, or, or medications, we have lots of different options and we need to tailor them obviously to, to the patient's needs. Um, treatment needs to be readily available, which is a big part of what we're trying to do here. Um, effective treatment, I mean, I just had a patient last week I got called on. He wasn't an opioid patient, he was a, an alcohol, and he was ready to get treatment, and we couldn't find him a bed. We just couldn't get him help that day, and, and who knows if, if he will, it will come back and, and get the help he needs. Um, 
Okay, so we need to uh, uh, attend to multiple needs. Uh, you know, co-occurring disorders is so huge. I mean, it's the kind of almost the norm. It is the norm, I would say, in this population. It needs to be flexible. Remaining in treatment for an adequate period of time is critical for treatment effectiveness. We have some data to show you um, on that. It's really stark. You guys have already seen some of that data already. Individual and or group counseling and other behavioral therapies are, are, are essential components of effective treatment for uh, addiction. Again, the co occurring disorders is just so, so common. Uh, medications are an important element of treatment for many patients. Addicted individuals with comorbid mental disorders should have both disorder treated in an integrated way, way. And I know we talked a little bit about integration and a lot of the programs here are integrated. Um, and some of the reasons why uh, integrated care um, is effective. Medical detox is, is really just the first step. It's not really, um, treatment per se, treatment does not need to be voluntary to be effective. That one sometimes I get sneers at when we say that, but we do have, just impartially, there is data that supports this idea that, that um, and in the state of Florida, you know, we have the Marchman Act and some of these mo more coercive, I came from California before um, I came to Florida and there was nothing like the Marchman Act. And when I first read it or heard about it, I'm like, oh my God, you can do that? You can take away somebody's civil liberties? And, and I'm a psychiatrist. I mean, I do it for suicide, but it was the first time that I, I, I had kind of um, heard and learned about it. And then working with the peer mentors, uh, I mean, they use it quite liberally in, in some programs and, and, they, and they swear by the effectiveness of it um, in certain cases, right? Uh, possible drug use during treatment must be Monitored continually, treatment programs should provide assessment for HIV, AIDS, hepatitis B and C, TB, and other infectious diseases. diseases. Recovering from drug addiction can be really uh, a long-term process. Yeah. I switched into this. So I saw these slides, and I thought that this message was a little bit um, polished a little too much, frankly. <laughs> And um, I also interpreted it as that these slides particularly were for substance use disorder. Um, my gig uh, is opioid use disorder. And interestingly enough, these NIDA principles were developed in like 2015, published 2017-ish. And then what I want people to focus on is this is the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. They took NIDA's data. They correlated a lot of other data. The important point is the date, March 20th, 2019, physically just released. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I think it actually blows a lot of things away. And I just want to read to you, I hate reading slides, but I'm going to read a few of them, uh, what their principles specifically for opioid use treatment disorder, opioid use disorder is. Statement number one, opioid use disorder is a chronic, treatable brain disease. FDA-approved medications to treat opioid use disorder are effective and save lives. Long-term retention on medications, not short-term, long-term to treat opioid use disorder is associated with improved outcomes. This one's very, very important. I'm going to have a specific slide about it. Please just hear me out for a second because I know a lot of you are based on uh, psychosocial cognitive behavioral therapy. But this is important. A lack of availability of behavioral interventions is not a sufficient justification to withhold medications to treat opioid use disorder. What does that mean? That pisses me off that I have emergency physicians, providers, that look me in the face and say, I'm not writing any MAT wool until somebody develops this robust treatment plan as an outpatient. That's false. You do not need, of course, it's ideal, but you do not need outpatient behavioral interventions or robust. And I'll show you more data on that. Uh, so those medications should not be withheld. Putting the patients on these medications makes them safer. Putting them on buprenorphine makes them safer. Engaging them in a methadone treatment plan, outpatient treatment plan, makes them safer for the time that they're in treatment. So we need to get these patients on medication, even though perfect behavioral counseling isn't available. Most people who could benefit from medication-based treat treatment for opioid use disorder do not receive it. Of course, the stats and access is inequitable across a subgroup of the population. The stats are that for those that we consider to be outpatient treatment providers for addiction therapy, the ones that we've engaged, only 20 to 30% engage in MAT. That's changing, thank goodness, for, because of uh, FADA's and DCF's efforts, but 
That's the standard, is not treating with medications. Medication-based treatment is effective across all treatment settings studied to date. Withholding or failing to have available all classes of FDA-approved medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder in any care or criminal justice setting is denying appropriate medical treatment. It can't be said any other way. It is unethical and it is substandard and it is below the standard of care. And I bet you, I'm not proud to say this because it just makes me want to vomit, but there are going to be lawyers that are going to soon say, did you offer this patient uh, medication assisted therapy? And if you didn't, then you're probably treating below the standard of care. And that's considered, that's the definition of malpractice. Confronting the major barriers to the use of medications to treat opioid use disorder is critical to addressing the opioid crisis. Is withholding medications for these PAUD patients below the standard of care? This is pulled right from not, uh, the same National Academy of Sciences. There is no scientific evidence that justifies withholding medications from OUD patients in any setting or denying social services, such as housing or income, to those individuals on medications for opioid use disorder. Therefore, to withhold treatment or deny services under these circumstances is unethical, period. So if you're taking part and you're not offering them medications, you're not doing the best for your patient. And given that these medications are known to save lives, it is arguable that withholding them from persons with OUD is unethical, as withholding insulin or blood pressure medications would be. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, we reviewed the Surgeon General Report, which was a few years old when we started working on the regional presentations that we did. And um, so I'm a psychiatrist, right? And I'm, I, I like behavioral health interventions for depression and for anxiety. Um, they work very well, maybe as well as medications, right? And you get a synergistic effect. I actually went through the Surgeon General Report and looked up every citation, because they also did strong language. And I agree that, that, that behavioral health and, and these wraparound services are recommended and should be a component of their care. But I went through every citation and the data is not robust, at least for all the citations in the Surgeon's General Report, in terms of, of straight out efficacy of adding this behavioral health care approach. Now, I think in the bigger picture, in terms of recovery and, and embracing a new life, and it, it, it's very important. But statistically, I think, and I, and I, I saw the Academy of Sciences actually have that, that book in PDF, I mean, I would agree with everything Mark is saying. I mean, there is a really clear evidence base now with medications that, that seemingly um, is, 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 is a little bit of a higher standard than we have so far for just purely evidence-based uh, behavioral slides, treatments. By the way, What's that? Those are my slides, by the way. Yeah, they were great. I love them. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> that's OK. I did in the last presentation with Mark, so please. Yeah, yeah that's OK. OK, so this is pretty cool. Um, so this is a slide, um, basically, showing how you need to be in treatment really to get better. So, you know, I'm, we're looking at these, these rates and you can see, I mean, if you, if you don't get any, if you don't get to a year, you're gonna have a really hard time si sustaining recovery. One to three years, not too bad. It climbs to 65, 70%. But if we can get three to five years, we're now entering, um, you know, pretty successful range. And, and in our other talks, we go into, you know, the physiology of the brain and, and some ideas about why this must be. But, but the idea is, you know, uh, you know, a few months, a month is, is just not, not enough. Um, and it's a, really a long-term project here. Um, so again, we talked about individualizing treatment. We're all about harm reduction, um, protection against overdose and death. Um, reduction in the use of opioid use disorder sy symptoms. This is the part of recovery. You know, how do we cope with life now uh, without the, the substances? And, um, and just being generally responsible for the management of these diseases. We have these psychosocial therapies that can take very much different forms. And I, and I think they are um, you know, critically Im important in terms of, of, of embracing this new life. Um, so I don't want to uh, shoot down the idea that they, that they shouldn't be part of the care program. I mean, I, 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 I'm totally in favor of them. But, but I agree, not offering an MAT for an opioid use disorder patient is shady at this point with the data that we have on the effectiveness of these medications versus what else we have, right? It's not like we have uh, a, a lot of great options um, for opioid use disorders. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier uh, about some of these recovery-oriented activities and, and some of the programs, um, self-help, mutual help, and then MATs, of course.
So that's this is my slide. <clears throat> the pointer thingy. Yep. And uh, and it addresses again uh, that issue about psychosocial or withholding medications uh, if psychosocial is not available. Uh, because it's a myth among physicians. To be successful with these meds in the ED, you need robust outpatient counseling available. This is a Cochrane uh, meta-analysis of numerous studies. Now, it's not exactly, this quote is a little bit misleading. Uh, adding any psychosocial support to maintenance treatment benefits does not add additional benefits. It really should say, we don't really know which specific psychosocial treatment support works the best to add a lot. That's really what it should say. But this is the way NIDA says it. We already said that. I think I have a better slide here. <clears throat> this is a little bit of a joke for ER doctors, just so that they drive the message home. We're, we're, we have ADD, so if we don't get a simple, straightforward message. So this is by an ER doctor who's a big proponent of MAT for uh, opioid use disorder, Ruben Strayer. He's one of my idols. Uh, okay, this is how NIDA says it specifically. Behavioral interventions in addition to medical management do not appear to be necessary as treatment in all cases. Some people may do well with medication and medication medical management alone. However, evidence-based behavioral interventions can be useful in engaging people with opioid use disorder in treatment, retaining them in treatment, improving outcomes, and helping them resume a healthy functioning life. There is inadequate evidence about which behavioral intervention provided in conjunction with medications for opioid use disorder are most helpful for which patients, including evidence on how effective peer support is. More research is needed to address this knowledge deficit. So that's the best way, I think, that really sums it up. It doesn't say that it's worthless. It just says it's not necessary. It's ideal, but not necessary. Uh, so we talked a little bit about this, or I think Mark may have, I'm um, sorry, Aaron had a comment about that earlier about, uh, you know, facilities that give this, this psychosocial model involving withdrawal management with or without medications, followed by ongoing treatment without meds, you know, historically has been a first line approach. Um, the, 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 you know, we showed you some data that really the success rate, um, greater than 85% relapse rate within the first year. If you, if you, if you do not employ an, an MAT um, after, after uh, you get them in and after you get them detoxed. Um, uh, and then the OD rate continues to climb, right? Because now patients are detoxed, they've uh, lost their tolerance, they use again, and they could potentially um, die. Um, okay, so opioid uh, detoxification outcomes, low rates of retention and treatment, high rates of relapse. Um, Said another way, sorry. Go ahead. Go for it, hit that slide. Well, let me just, just go, go through this real yeah. quick. Um, so I like this quote, right? Detoxification may be good for a lot of things. Staying off drugs is not one of them, right? So it's, it's really just an initial, here you go. So this is the way I say it. For opioid use disorder, abstinence does not work for the majority of patients. In fact, for 90 to 95% of them, uh, MAT of addiction results in reductions in overdose death, illicit drug use, criminal activity, arrests, risky behaviors, HIV and hepatitis C incidents, as well as improvement in health status, functioning, and quality of life. Very important, the alternative to MAT isn't a drug-free patient. Rather, it's a continually relapsing patient. And when the era of superfentanyls, relapse has a high association with death, this is how the National Institute of Sciences says it. Even a single use of opioids after detoxification can result in a life-threatening or fatal overdose. Following detoxification, tolerance to the euphoria with opioid use remains much higher than the tolerance to respiratory depression. So they need more to get euphoric, but their respiratory depression, the, the brain center, has a diminished tolerance, and so it kills them. So discharging a patient addicted to opioids who is in withdrawal is more dangerous than any discharge we would ever consider in any other context. I say that to emergency providers because we would never discharge a patient home with a high risk of stroke. We would never discharge a patient home with a high risk of heart attack. I mean, if there's a risk of 2% of MI, myocardial infarction, if risk of 2%, we admit that patient to the hospital. What's the risk of overdose for a patient who has overdosed? It's about 10 to 15% in one year. They're going to fatally overdose if they've come in for a near fatal overdose. And we discharge them with a pat on the butt and a piece of some numbers and say, good luck, man, you're on your own, sayonara. That's substandard again, and it's ethically dubious. 
All right, so the ultimate goal, obviously, is long-term recovery, maintain with or without medication, to, and provide protection from overdose and death while improving physical, emotion, emotional, and psychological health. So why use medications? Because they work. MAT makes the recovery process much safer. For those that are big proponents of behavioral health and cognitive behavioral therapy, the patient's brain is actually settled. They're not having the cravings, and they can actually interpret and um, be more receptive to that behavioral health uh, therapy. And that's because addiction involves real physical changes in the brain. I've already mentioned that 80 to 90% relapse uh, to any drug use without it. There's much more increased treatment retention, an 80% decrease in illicit drug use and crime, and a 50 to 60% decrease in all-cause death rate. If there is any medical treatment today that reduced fatality by 50 or 60%, the person would win the Nobel Peace Prize of, on, for medicine. Because the best strategies that we have for sepsis, which is a big bacterial blood infection, reduces for mortality maybe by 35, 40%. But here we have a drug for a multitude of our patients that's available, and yet we withhold it because of stigma or our own issues with they're not really cured because they're on a medication or it's a crutch. No, it saves their lives and it's available to them and it's, we, should, we need to make it more available. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's such an, an interesting point. Um, so behaviorally in mental health, we sometimes use um, behavioral techniques to try to get people to do things or, or whatever. Um, but I don't think we, a psychiatrist would ever withhold medication from a patient who has, suffers with schizophrenia because he missed an appointment or you know, because he wasn't compliant to all the meds. Because we understand that biologically there's a real good link between what's going on in the brain and the manifestations of their symptoms. So this idea that, that you, know, you try to coerce with kicking somebody out of treatment for what is really essentially a biologic brain illness is... is, is um, I don't know, it, it, it's not, it, it just doesn't feel right at, at all. Okay, so now we'll get into the medication piece. I really like this slide. I know this is kind of your, your, your yeah, thing, but, but this is interesting. Um, okay, so I start using drugs. They feel good, right? Opioids feel good, drugs feel good. I get my normal, I take the drug, and I'm, I get into this euphoria. And I'm gonna take you through a cycle farm or anything like that, but it just happens to hit certain things in your brain that make you feel well. Brain is designed basically 100, plus million years ago to sense a reward and the brain says, okay, we want to repeat that behavior. I'm in nature, I eat a fruit. Oh my God, that fruit tastes so good. Do it again, right? Well, the same thing with drugs. The problem is the drugs are much more potent, right? They release much more of these neurotransmitters than a, a tasty snack that you might find hanging off a tree. So you get these spikes of euphoria, okay? And that in itself is, is how the cycle starts, right? So we won't go through the, the, the physiologic process anymore. What's interesting is after you get those highs repeatedly over and over again, you kind of reset your steady state for this kind of hedonic set point. What feels fun and good and euphoric begins to slowly wane over time after you keep launching these assaults uh, on your brain in terms of releasing these neurotransmitters. And then you get to this point here, which is this is the tolerance and physical dependence where, where you're no longer really using these drugs to feel great anymore. It's not a smoking a joint on a Friday night or something like that. It's not having a, a few beers to celebrate your anniversary. Now it's maintaining the opioid in your system. Uh, so we call this positive reinforcement, right? I take the drug, I feel, I feel well. It's going to positively reinforce me to use it again. This is the negative reinforcement. So both of these play a role. So this is basically, I'm taking the drug to not feel crappy all of the time, and that is equally as reinforcing. So this happens, you, you have this switch and it's no longer, I'm doing this to, 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 to have these out of body experiences or to feel great, it, it's just basically to not be in pain um, anymore. This is, uh, oh, you wanna go through this? I like, I like this slide too. Oh, you can go for it. I just go wanted ahead. to say, this part here, I just started to read uh, Why Johnny Can't Quit. I think it's by Kevin O. He's an MD. It's about addiction, obviously. Why Johnny Can't Quit. He has a very th simple theory. I I'm very interested to sort of throw it out at you and then maybe get feedback six months later. But his theory is, is that a lot of what we treat is actually not addiction and rather just a very, very bad habit. He says that he believes true addiction for the fundamental basis for true addiction to start is a true euphoria with the use of the medication. 
In other words, everybody says sort of like, well, opioids cause this sedative effect, this quiet, calm. Well, that's what they do for a lot of people. In fact, I've taken Percocet and it, did, it definitely did that for me. But his argument is that true addicts, the tough, hardcore addicts, those that are suffering full-blown opioid use disorder, when they took an opioid, they became euphoric at the first time they took it. So I'd almost like you to do a, almost an anecdotal poll with your folks. And you know, a lot of alcoholics that we've deemed alcoholics, they didn't start with a pure euphoria when they started to get, quote, intoxicated. A lot of what we label as alcoholics just used it as a sedative to get rid of their problems. They used it as an escape or an oblivion, but it's those alcoholics that took alcohol and got this genetic predisposition to create profound euphoria in the beginning that actually sets it in and creates true addiction. It's just very, very interesting why Johnny can't quit. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, and again, a lot of this comes from the, any, I, I imagine several of you here are familiar with the DSM-5 or at least have heard of it and kind of understand its role. It's kind of like how we diagnose things in psychiatry. You, don't, you won't find the word addiction in there uh, in this kind of Bible of, 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 of behavioral health really worldwide at this point. So you will find opioid use disorder, mild, moderate, and severe, and how you calculate it, you add up this, and if you get this number, it's mild or moderate. So I'm a little uncomfortable as a psychiatrist with addiction. I mean, last two years I've been um, doing it a lot, so I'm more comfortable with it. But addiction to me really means those se severe, maybe some component of those substance use disorder severes, right? So there's a, there's a different animal. Um, That's what he said. Yeah, th that something really happens to a segment of folks who really are, are just completely susceptible to not being able to manage the use of these, um, you know, what might have started as a recreational um, drug initially. But you will get folks who are maybe lower on that continuum who maybe might have more control and, and more options. But, I, I, you know, when we use the term addict, I, in my head, I'm thinking of, you know, the really the severest of the uh, substance use disorders. So what I like about this slide is because I, I was, you know, it, it gives me some data to kind of look at. and. Um, Basically, how these patients are doing um, over time with these meds. We say they're effective. Well, what, 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 what does that mean? Well, oh, the, the methadone data that was even presented here today was pretty convincing, right? These are great numbers. I wish I had these numbers for, for mental health, frankly. I mean, that, that, those are pretty good numbers. Um, so, you know, buprenorphine is pretty good, too. That's, that's, by the way, retention in treatment for a year in 12 months, retention in treatment at 12 months with a significant reduction or elimination of illicit drug use. That's what those numbers represent. So I was actually, and I know the caveats from the data that was presented today that some 40% is, is whatever, but I was really struck that the buprenorphine numbers were so low compared to what we would think we would find. I was okay with naltrexone because I, you know, over time, oh, you know, it really separates, you know, people tend to drop out of naltrexone treatment. I mean, there's certain populations where you kind of force them to take it or, or they lose their medical license or something like that. There's, certain, there's a class of patients, and we'll get into how to pick what for what class of patients. So it can be extremely effective for certain populations or subpopulations of patients. But overall, I was struck at the difference. I mean, that's a, that's a big difference um, in terms of uh, retention. Uh, for a year between between the medications and, and I'll be curious to see once the data gets cleaned up I remember I saw previous to the day that was presented today another Vivitrol slide from this program I think it was and Darren we can talk about it But in in the six months that I saw we were down to about 10% too I don't know if that was presented last year or not, but it and uh, It's just you know interest. Yeah, go ahead. I think a caveat to that data is that I think because this is limited funding there are <coughs> arbitrary time limits yeah, and that's striking that it would be that are, far off. Are, okay. It's a policy issue that we will talk about a little bit today of arbitrary timelines, and, and they're coming from a good place, meaning like they're trying to get as many people in as possible, um, but they may be like a six months and then we're going to start. You know. yeah, and I think there's other factors too, because these are folks who you know, are uninsured. I mean, these social determinants of health out the wazoo, income, I mean, all these things. I mean, they're a much tougher population, but we would expect it to be a little closer, so I'd be curious. Um, okay, take it away, Aaron. Uh, some of these slides are a little bit clunky. Um, Medication-assisted treatment, I mean, achieve full prevention 
of both signs and symptoms of withdrawal for 24 hours. The dose should reduce or eliminate. I mean, that's an important one. Basically, the dosing should not be at an arbitrary limit. What the dosing should be, it's kind of like, well, if there's an infection and we have continued infection, we use a higher dose of antibiotics. Well, if they're still having drug craving or um, uh, obsession over the drug, then the dose probably needs to be uh, elevated. Um, and the other goal is to block reinforcing effects of illicit opiates, uh, should see significant decrease in opiate positive urine drug screens. Well, um, I don't really know. I, I, you know, I'm an emergency department doctor. I just put them on it. Um, I'm frustrated with some of the um, uh, protocols that are used uh, in the outpatient treatment community. And if they pop positive for a drug screen, then they get kicked off. Again, we've talked about really the ethics of that uh, as far as it being treated as a disease process. So uh, the main one, the most robust treatment of uh, MAT, the most mo widely used, the most data that we have is definitely methadone. Um, obviously, it's a Schedule II narcotic, very controlled. It's a full receptor agonist. What does that mean, mu receptor? Well, in your body, we have mu receptors. These are receptors that are built to, re to respond to endorphins. Um, endorphin, interestingly enough, means endogenous morphine. So we make opioid substances in our body when we run or fight or flight or when we're stressed. And so endorphins bind to the mu receptor. Well, opiates from the poppy binds to the mu receptor. A full agonist means when it binds to that receptor, it turns the dimmer switch all the way forward, all the way bright, full bright, full agonist. That's what it does at the receptor site. There's no ceiling effect. That means as you continue to give the dose, these people will get finally respiratory depression, suppression. There is euphoria associated with high doses, but because it's a longer acting drug, very, very long half-life, it doesn't have that like punch to give them the euphoria. So um, importantly, it's only distributed by federally regulated, extraordinarily federally regulated outpatient treatment programs, right? Uh, and it requires initially daily dosing. I'm gonna call on John Essenberg. He's um, my operation PAR uh, provider. Um, what, what did you say at the last meeting? Like how long do they have to be on daily dosing before they can even qualify for take-home doses? Typically it's gonna be 90 days before they even get one take-home dose, but uh, it's set specifically in the state law where 30 days, think the drug screen is 30 days, stable in treatment. There's a bunch of other criteria that they have to meet before they can Earn one. By the end of year one, they could get up to four, or two, year two, five, year three, six. It would take them five years in treatment and three years consecutive monthly negative drug screens to get 27, which is the most you can get. Wow. But I mean, that's an example of a behavioral intervention with a medication assisted treatment, right? I, I don't know if we have time for discussions about what you guys think about that, but I, I will point out if you go back to one slide. So, methadone is a little bit of a different an animal, it's a full agonist. So if you use an opioid on methadone, there is no ceiling effect, right? So you could kill yourself as opposed to some of the meds that we're going to talk about. So, so I, you know, it is a little bit of a, a riskier treatment option for somebody who may continue to use the opioid on top of it as opposed to the next medication that we're going to talk about. Good point. Yeah, that's a huge point, Eduardo. Uh, it's synergistic. It, it's the same as essentially heroin or Percocet or, or Vicodin. So if somebody goes home and takes heroin, Percocet, or Vicodin, now they have more opioid, they have this really profound, profoundly long-acting uh, drug on board, and it is associated with quite a few overdoses, fatal overdoses. It's often found, I think, 10 to 20 percent or something to that effect, like 10 to 12 percent. So it is, in, a, in some respects, quote, a dangerous drug. The benefits of it, though, are is that you have that daily dosing, and if I, you know, I went and visited Operation PAR and was like blown away by how robust their programs are, all these treatment rooms, individual treatment rooms. So it's very structured and regulated. They have to come every day. There's nurses, doctors, and uh, uh, mid-levels there. They get psychosocial need assessments, supportive counseling, family support services, referral to community services. So diminishing some of those negative um, adverse, uh, what do we call them? The uh, FIU, you said FIU, adverse uh, when determinants, thank you, social determinants. That was a brand new uh, term for me three days ago, so I got to repeat it a few more times. 
Um, impact of methadone, it's the, ro again, most robust, it's undeniable, most reduction in death rate, reduction of IV drug abuse, reduction in crime days, we've talked about this, reduction in relapse to IV, improved employment, health, and social functions. You know, there's a stigma even among providers. I mean, I said, oh God, I'm sending people to a methadone clinic. And it took John to t tell me on the phone, and I use this all the time, he said, Aaron, you have to understand that there's 1,200 patients that we see, what is it, a day? Is it a day? What are you saying? Yeah, I mean, we have in, in You dispense, in our, in our Fort Myers program. right, 1,200 patients that they're treating essentially on a daily basis. 900, 950 of them are lawyers, you know, nurses, functioning, you know, drivers, commercial drivers. They are functioning people in the society. The other, I'm not good at public math, a few hundred, are somewhat devious, could be selling, abusing, uh, diverting, and so, you know, it's that small population that gives that methadone clinic a bad name, but for the majority of patients, um, it's very positive and powerful and keeping them recover in recovery or some semblance of recovery. Some patients may need very long term. I can't stand that. Some patients. I put in dot, 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 actually a lot more than some. Most should probably, we just should need to change our paradigm and say that we need most on long term. Others, after more stability structure, may be able to eventually taper off, and there's possibly a tradition, a transition to buprenorphine or naltrexone. Yeah, and before we move on, I mean, so I teach medical students, right, and they're all into the phar pharmacology, how these med works, and, and they got, you know, we present methadone to them as a full agonist, and they're puzzled. They're like, what do you mean? You know, you're giving them, you're replacing one full agonist, heroin or whatever, fentanyl, Oxycontin, whatever, with another. I mean, and, and it's because we've had data for so many years that if they're in methadone, these very structured programs, they don't die, right? They don't, they die much less often, right? They have much better outcomes. So it's, and we'll get into a little bit, I mean, it's, it's, it's the treatment, okay? Um, and I hope we've explained a little bit of, of what, why it might be different, why it's probably better than finding something on the street or something illegally and taking it on your own. And there's loads of data. We have no more data uh, for opioid use disorders than, than methadone. Um, but you will get this little stigma thing, and I'll get it from my patients. Oh, I don't want to take you know, something that's, that, that's the same, but it's, it's just such robust evidence about how patients do so much better with this program. And we're gonna to talk to that, speak to that as far as the stigma, you know, and the real answer, the short answer for even for medical students or other providers, emergency doctors, is you're considering, you're, you're mixing up dependence and addiction uh, massively, and I have a great slide on that. Um, but anyway, as far as long-term treatment or that, hey, the myth MAT should not be used long-term, it's a crutch, that's crazy. Well, there's no one size fit all for all duration of MAT. It's just like treating an insulin dependent diabetic or a hypertensive patient or a COPD patient. Research shows that patients on MAT for at the very least one to two years have the greatest rate of long-term success. Currently, no evidence to support benefits from cessation, no evidence. And for some patients, MAT could be indefinite. Just get over it. That's what we have to do to keep these patients safe, to get them into a functioning you know, uh, community, a part of an interlocking functioning community, um, to be a better parent to their kids um, so that their kids have less negative social determinants. Uh, patients with long-term abstinence possibly can follow a slow taper schedule under a physician's direction when free of stressors, those determinants, and environmental triggers, and when their brain chemistry normalizes, and they have had successful emotional resilience training through the behavioral health, psychosocial health, psychosocial group counseling, to attempt only at that time to attempt dose reduction or total cessation. And for methadone maintenance, the National Institute of Drug Abuse states 12 months of treatment is the minimum. So we got to dispel that myth of, you know, three months just to get them on it, to get them better, and then they can detox. That's a great idea. It's not a great idea. It's a horrible idea. Methadone retains patients in treatment and reduces illicit drug use more effectively than placebo, medical supervised withdrawal, or no treatment, clinical numerous trials. It works, it works, it works. Who has stated it's an absolute essential medication? Uh, we talked about this. It's associated with reduced risk of overdose-related deaths. So we said that. MAT, 50% reduction in all-cause mortality. This is huge. Reduced risk of HIV and hepatitis C infection. The number one cause of HIV, hepatitis C, endocarditis. By the way, endocarditis is 
you inject bacteria into your blood. Bacteria love the heart valves. They're just juicy and they're like a perfect culture substrate for bacteria. And the bacteria grow these vegetations like fungus vegetations on the heart valve and the heart valve becomes incompetent and floppy and the patient suffers these horrendous fluid in the lungs. They can't walk five feet and they need valve replacement. One valve, one valve, not the charge to the patient, the cost of one valve is about $28,000 for that one valve. Now the charges to the patient is extraordinary. That's another conversation, but then to get rid of that infection that's embedded in those heart valves, the patient has to be on six weeks of IV antibiotics in a structured setting, IV antibiotics, six weeks. I mean, the cost savings of just preventing one case of endocarditis for a community is huge. I'll talk about that. Oh, I don't know if I included those slides. Lower rates of cellulitis, what is that? That's infections from injecting and you get a skin infection, cellulitis. Lower rates of HIV risky behavior. Those are the acquisition harms that define uh, addiction. In other words, they become dependent on the medication, yes, but they don't have addiction uh, acquisition harms. In other words, addiction can be easily defined by saying continued compulsive use despite negative social consequences. And so they don't have negative social consequences. I take my lisinopril every day. I don't have any negative social consequences with taking lisinopril. I'm not selling myself. I'm not stealing somebody's radio. I'm not mugging somebody. Um, I'm not injecting to get my lisinopril. So reduce criminal behavior, or what we define as crimes associated with it. Okay, so what about buprenorphine? This to me is sort of the star of the show. It's very near and dear to my heart because it's great for emergency department patients. It's a Thebane derivative. Nobody cares about that. I'm not really sure why that's in there, but <laughs> Thebane is one of the original components of a poppy, but who cares? It's a partial agonist, mu receptor partial agonist, which means it binds to the mu receptor that I told you, and it's only partial, it, the dimmer switch goes halfway. So it's a nice warm glow. What is a kappa antagonist? This is very, very interesting. Part of our endorphins that we make is a protein called a dynorphin, dynorphin. And what that is, is it's a protein that binds to our kappa receptors. So when we are stressed or experiencing um, cravings, that anxious, anxiety feeling is because of these dynorphins that are binding to our kappa receptors. So interestingly enough, buprenorphine, an antagonist, means it blocks the kappa receptor. So those stresses that the patient has when they're starting to have cravings, it blocks that. So patients on buprenorphine say, it's crazy, I just have this like clear-headed thought process. I can just function better, and it's because of it's a kappa antagonist. Is that a good description? I like it because that's, that's that negative reinforcement that I was talking about earlier, using because you feel so crummy, right? To, to avoid that feeling crummy is a major cause of, of relapse. High affinity mu receptor, what does that mean? It means, I've always tried to come up with an analogy for this, but it's like, what's that? Magnets. It's the most powerful magnet. I like that. I was making it a relationship thing. I was like, it's a super clingy partner who really doesn't give you that much love. <laughs> it pushes all other partners away. It's super important <clears throat> because it does. And like the magnet analogy is good for that, but it's the most powerful magnet, but I almost like the relationship one. It's, they bind to you so intently that it pushes all other opioids away. So if you are on buprenorphine because it binds and it's only turned the dimmer switch on halfway, if you inject, you have to inject two to three to four times your normal dose of medication to get the buprenorphine off the receptor again. Said another way, let's say a patient is riding a motorcycle and they're on buprenorphine steadily and they're doing well and they crash and break their femur. If they come into the trauma center, we normally give two milligrams of Dilaudid, which is a very powerful hydromorphone opioid. We give two milligrams to any patient who's in a massive trauma with a leg amputation. We'd have to give them four to six to start to push the bup off to work. So it keeps the patient somewhat safe when they're on it. That's why I say 
Doc emergency doctors say, well, they're gonna divert the medication, Aaron. And I'm like, great, we should be like Pied Pipers and throw it like Johnny Appleseed. Because if they divert it and take it, they're protected while they're on it. I'm being honest, I'm being serious. I'm trying to be entertaining so you don't fall asleep or get hungry or hangry. Okay, so it's got a slow, dis slow dissociation, long uh, half-life at the receptor, just like uh, methadone, it's a very long half-life, 36 hours half-life. This CPP450, blah, 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 it means it doesn't react with a lot of drugs. So it's not a lot of drug-drug interactions. Active metabolite, who cares about that? You don't care about that. The liver metabolizes it, and then we pee the other 30% out through the kidneys. It's hemodialysis safe, variety of formulations. It's very safe in pregnancy. Um, there are, we're gonna get into the formulations. It's really a quite cool drug, frankly. Like I said that, partial opioid antagonist, ceiling effect. That means it's much safer, less euphorian, and less respiratory depression. I'll show you a graph on that. Very, very high receptor affinity. Very powerful magnet, very clingy uh, partner, super clingy partner. More so than any other opioid. Again, I'm just going to say that. No other opioid binds as strongly as uh, buprenorphine does. In fact, the antidote, naloxone or Narcan, we have to give higher doses of Narcan when they're on buprenorphine because it binds so tightly. So to push the buprenorphine off, to that clingy partner, it really needs higher doses. So that makes the patient quite safe. And that is why it's so high. If a patient comes in on a heroin and they're very high on heroin or just did it an hour ago and they say, I want help, I can't give them buprenorphine immediately. If I do, what happens? Well, they're on heroin, which is a full switch uh, binder, agonist, and I give them buprenorphine, it pushes the heroin off and goes to half switch, and usually not at even a high dose. And so they immediately experience withdrawal, which is very painful. And that's why a lot of patients, they don't get the drug in the right way. And so when I say, hey, I have this drug called buprenorphine, they're like, whoa, 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 I don't want that, man. That made me sick the last time I tried it because somebody gave it to them on the street and they were halfway high on their Percocet or heroin or whatever, and they popped it and it put them into withdrawal and they think they're allergic to it. They're just using it wrong. Yeah, actually, when we start patients on buprenorphine, we act, they come in already in mild withdrawal, largely for that reason, so we don't kind of self-induce it. Absolutely, so the way to in, induct a patient correctly is to use this scale called the cow scale. I didn't get into it today, but we can talk about it later. We got 15 minutes. Um, a cow scale, and we, it determines the level of withdrawal the patient is in, and when they're in a certain level of withdrawal, then we can give them a buprenorphine dose. Uh, it's less abuse prone and blocks more abuse prone opioids. I already went over that. And it's uniquely suited to treat opioid addiction, less dangerous, less abuse prone versus methadone, more likely to abolish cravings, protects users from overdose by more dangerous opioids, like I said. Okay, what about Suboxone? What is Suboxone? Suboxone is simply buprenorphine, the active ingredient, with naloxone in a little film strip, much like those Listerine strips that you put on your tongue. The reason naloxone is in there is naloxone sublingually is not absorbed and not an active ingredient when it's sublingually taken. But if the patient tries to be a little sneaky and boils it down in their spoon and injects it, then the naloxone reverses them. It blocks their opioids. And so it's an abuse deterrent uh, me, um, formulation. That's what Suboxone is. So just to keep, we had methadone, which was a full agonist, turn the lights up all the way. We have buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist, halfway. That ceiling effect, it doesn't have that. And then we just introduced naloxone, right, which is a really strong antagonist. I remember the first time I used it, I was a med student, and we were inducing it on a, bone cancer patient who was kind of too sedated. And literally, as we were pushing the needle in, it was IV, he just woke up and immediately started clenching in pain. I mean, that's how quick it is. That's how strong it is. So it's a really strong antagonist. Um, bypassed, if you take it under the tongue, and I think you're probably gonna, you know, what happens if you, if you try to inject it? Um, yeah. Completely inert. The naloxone in Suboxone is completely inert. By the way, Subutex, Subutex are little pills that are sublingual, and it's just pure buprenorphine. By the way, pure buprenorphine, Subutex, is about $2 a pill on average. B 
buprenorphine with naloxone, this deterrent, abuse deterrent one, is about $4 a strip. So, you know, if you're choosing a patient and you think that they're really into recovery and really want, and they're very engaged and very motivated, then I will write the patient for buprenorphine. If I'm worried about them diverting or abusing, then I might write them for Suboxone. But oftentimes my writing of a prescription is only three days to get them to Operation PAR anyway. So I just write them for buprenorphine alone because it's cheaper and I know that they're probably gonna get it. Uh, fill it is what I mean. Slow acting versus long acting, we talked about that. This is kind of uh, overkill here. Oh, everybody, any physician can write buprenorphine, crazy, to treat withdrawal or pain. Believe, believe it or not, I use buprenorphine as a good pain medication. I like it a lot for pain because it doesn't give much euphoria and it treats their pain and it's long acting. Uh, but I can write that on a whim. I can do all the prescriptions I want forever and ever and ever, amen. But if I write it, to treat addiction, I need this eight-hour online course by the uh, FDA, I mean the uh, DEA, called an X waiver. And there are 900,000 physicians in the United States that have a DEA license. They can write you for all the opioids you want. There are only 36,000 in the United States that have an X waiver. So to write for a very safe, treatment-oriented opioid, I need eight hours of an online course. But if you come to my pain clinic and I, I can write you for 300 oxy-IR, uh, oxycodones or uh, uh, oxycontin that are 100 milligrams and essentially you can sell it to your entire block. Uh, it's really backwards and we're working on it, but we'll see. Big seller, buprenorphine is completely safe in pregnancy. This is also a financial uh, case for it. Neonates exposed to buprenorphine needed 90% less morphine to treat their neonatal abstinence syndrome when they're born. In other words, their withdrawal, their dependence, they're not addicted. Why aren't babies addicted? Can somebody answer that? They can't steal out of your purse. <laughs> There's no acquisition harms. They're dependent, very good. There's no acquisition harms. The baby isn't selling itself to get, you know, its morphine dose. Now, it's got cravings, it it's needs them, it's physiologically dependent, but it's not, they're not born addicted. It drives me nuts. 43% um, shorter hospital stay and 58% shorter duration of medical treatment for NAS babies compared to those receiving methadone. So it's even better than methadone in that, in that setting. Lower risk of overdose for mom, fewer drug interactions, um, and they have the option of using an outpatient setting. That's good sometimes and bad sometimes. Sometimes we've talked about that. Yeah, I just wanted to do one last plug for this dependence addiction thing. So in the DSM, which is the book to diagnose substance use disorders, they just, they had a new version in 2013. So prior, that's which is five, which is what we're using now. Prior to that, it was DSM-4-TR. One of the things they changed when they, and that's not too long ago, 2013, was that those points that you counted, having tolerance or dependence would count against you in the DSM-4TR. I can tell you, I can give anybody here tolerance or dependence physiologically when I, when I order these really strong medications, right? Your body's just a physiologic process. You're going to have it. So when they, when they updated it to the DSM-5, they added the caveat, understanding that it's a physio dependency is, is physiologic, right? It's, it's, it's not a choice, right? It's, it's, it's physiologic that if a doctor is prescribing these medications, you do not count them. So if I'm prescribing buprenorphine for your opioid use disorder and you're gonna have dependence, you're gonna have tolerance because it's physiologic, they don't count as points. So it's now embedded in the actual way we actually um, diagnose these conditions. If I'm getting that same buprenorphine out on the street and I'm not under a doctor's care, then it, then, then it counts, right? Because you know, they're, they're, if you're in treatment, they're going to say, okay, you know, we're, we're not going to count it against you because you have a physician monitoring your care. But the, the fundamental point is everybody, you know, we're, we can give you dependence on, on a, a wide range of medications. It's just how the body responds when you're constantly getting the same thing all of the time. All right, I got to zoom here because uh, I believe Mr. Fontaine is going to cut us off. So uh, partial agonist, what does that mean again? Full agonist, this is heroin. As you, this is the dose. As you increase dose, the mu receptor intrinsic activity activates fully and you swamp the receptor and the patient stops breathing because that's how overdose occurs. We take the center of the brain that makes us breathe autonomically and we shut it down. But interestingly enough, with buprenorphine, it's a partial agonist. As you add more dose, there's a mu receptor intrinsic activity. The dimmer switch is only halfway 
there's a nice glow no matter how much more you add on. So they'll, you'll hear some providers say, it's overdose proof. It's not overdose proof. Why isn't it overdose proof? Because if they use other substances, it can act synergistically. So alcohol, benzo, Xanax, Ativan, crack, you know, who, who else, whatever they're using, uh, they can get a crash and uh, oh, still overdose. But if they're just clean on buprenorphine, excuse me, if they're just only selectively on buprenorphine, it is very difficult to overdose even with high doses of buprenorphine. And I'm just going to say that you'll hear people say, well, what about high-dose buprenorphine therapy? This comes up. If a patient comes into the emergency department and I'm a lazy uh, ER doctor that has not gotten my X waiver, sorry, ER docs, I'm a, okay, or I'm not a motivated ER doctor, um, and I want to kind of end around the laws, I could say, oh, let me give you the normal dose for buprenorphine is about 16 milligrams, 16 to 24 milligrams. Some people are saying, well, you don't need an X waiver if you give them 32 milligrams up front. The long acting half-life of the medication will last for two days until they get to see the clinic. And by the way, they won't overdose. Eh. Number one, I say, just get your freaking X waiver, please. And number two, I don't know. There's not a lot of evidence. And how do you know that they're not going to get drunk or, you know, get, have a six pack and then you've given them a high dose of buprenorphine and it's sort of in the experimental stages. But that's why people are talking about high dose buprenorphine. Sublingual films, buccal mucosa, injectable, sublucade, November 2017. This is a long acting 30 day shot. Uh, May 2016, probufine. It's an implantable six month buprenorphine. So, some people are really excited about these two. I don't know yet the costs. It's technic, a yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, because they're new, of course. What about bute prescriptions in France? As bute prescriptions went up, heroin overdoses went down pretty precipitously. Followed the same in an, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Here's overdoses, heroin overdoses went down as the green line bute went up. And interestingly, as methadone prescriptions went up yeah, too. These are open deaths, right? So it's you can just see how it's saving lives, right? Got to go quick here. This is kind of a silly slide. Shows bupe taper, then placebo plus counseling. So basically counseling alone, a control group, no retention in treatment for a year in the placebo group with buprenorphine, 75% retention in treatment for a year. Pretty big deal. Okay, naltrexone. Um, injectable naltrexone. What is injectable naltrexone? Naltrexone is basically the opioid antidote it binds to the opioid receptor and blocks it. It does nothing. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't give it any light at all. It just holds it and blocks it. And it blocks it from other magnets binding like Percocet or heroin or fentanyl. So it has its uses. It's definitely valuable in a very specific subset of patients in my opinion. Um, and some of the literature as well. There is a very early dropout rate that's common. The patients say that the shots are very painful, uh, and they're also about four, 1200 to $1,400. Some people say $1,600 a dose for 30 days. 30-day uh, duration um, must be, this is the most important one here. I love it when some, well, not somehow, uh, I'll just say it. Alchermes, the company that makes Vivitrol, has heavily marketed this drug to judges and lawmakers uh, and the criminal justice system as well, outside of justice, like jails. And I'm gonna be honest, they are, have there's some pretty widespread accusations that they pitched it as better than methadone and buprenorphine. They've toned back down on that a bit, but Every lawmaker that I've mentioned MAT to says, oh, Dr. Wall, what if we just got you naltrexone? You can just give them a Vivitrol shot and cure. They're cured in your emergency department. And I say, no, no, sir or miss. They have to be off of opioids for seven to 10 days before I can institute them on naltrexone. Why? Because it puts them in profound withdrawal. And you can't really reverse it. It's very difficult to get them out of withdrawal. So if they're a user, they have to, quote, detox off of medication and then get their shot of naltrexone. But I just taught you 10, 15 slides ago that 
I don't even believe in detox because I think detox sets you up for failure and sets you up for less tolerance and sets you up for overdose. So in my clinical opinion, I think detox does patients harm. So why would I ever put this patient into detox off seven, 10 days from the emergency department? First of all, it's impossible. And second of all, I just don't buy into it. Where does naltrexone really work very, very well? Interestingly enough for alcoholics and and people would say, well, why alcohol? What? How does it diminish alcohol cravings? Well, it goes back to those endorphins. It binds to the mu receptor and alcoholics. When you drink alcohol, you release some endorphins that bind to the mu receptor. And so if you block that mu receptor, patients with alcoholism have less craving, just like there is some less craving with opioids as well. But interestingly, they're using it a lot um, in uh, alcoholics that are into um, moderation treatment, not abstinence. So those patients that can tolerate a drink of wine or here or there, they say that it definitely diminishes their need to binge. So it's very interesting. And where does it work for opioids very, very well? It works for high functioning, high paid professionals, a, 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 a airline pilots, uh, nurses, doctors, and uh, CEOs and lawyers. And they have a robust treatment uh, and they have diminished negative social. Um, uh, so Aaron, I know we're short on time, but I just yeah. wanna jump in. So we talked about naloxone before being a, a, an antagonist. Naltrexone is the same thing, antagonist. I teach my medical students naltrex, a trek is a long walk. So naltrexone is a long acting version and the long naloxone is the one that immediately saves people's lives. And I, I wanna stress, the so seven to 10 days, people die sometimes trying to, to hang on to start naltrexone and then they just overdose and now the dependent uh, the tolerance is all out of whack so if you can get through that seven to ten days it's not bad and if you have the right patient population it's a, it's a great medication but but there are some wrinkles and this one's big too if they've been on it for 30 days let's say they get one shot yay success woohoo we got them a shot 30 days they're off of opioids their tolerance is diminished and now they're craving and they don't want to go back and get their shot. So what do they do? They use, they relapse, they overdose, and there's some evidence that it actually sets them up for fatal overdose. OD concerns, duration of treatment, impact on mortality reduction. Um, it is good for those that are not interested in um, agonist therapy, the dimmer switches or high or low, they don't want it. Motivation for AA model of recovery, it sort of works in that model. Uh, I have some issues with that. Um, Currently abstinent, high risk for relapse, those that are younger, lower duration of opioid use disorder, um, or those that don't wanna be quote, physically dependent. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm just, obviously I'm not a big fan. Um, I'm not gonna go into the studies. Uh, they've, compa they've compared it to, um, they've compared it to placebo and then they've compared it to uh, use of buprenorphine. And they basically showed, quote, similar effectiveness. I actually looked at the study. I don't think it's actually all that similar. And they stated that, quote, oh, it happens to be more difficult to start patients on uh, naltrexone than buprenorphine. And you got to read those studies very carefully. Very, it, very carefully. Because if they don't make it into treatment because they right. couldn't tolerate the seven to ten days, a lot of studies don't count them. Yeah, they cut they them really out. They really should push it forward as a failure, but a lot of them right. do not. Uh, no risk of diversion, they can't sell it, buy it, whatever. No risk of overdose by the drug itself. These are all true long-acting formulation. I will say it's a great tool. It's the only one we have that's a complete antagonist, right? And there are some patients who just don't want to be on any kind of partial or full agonist in terms of the opioid receptor. So I, I like having that option, but and it's, it's different. I will mention what Mr. Fontaine mentioned to me, and I think it is valuable. Naltrexone was the first component of MAT that became acceptable to politicians as they were designing policy. So for that, it's the gateway drug to MAT, in my opinion. <laughs> Lastly, opioid addiction, desperate need to avoid withdrawals, cravings, perpetual cycle of highs and lows, acquisitions harms, poverty, ha frantic behavior, injection harms, street drug harms. When we get them dependent, scheduled opioid consumption, freedom from addiction harm, and a normal life is possible. What about MAT is not effective because it doesn't immediately end drug dependence? Well, uh, you're never really curing. We don't cure any disease. We don't cure, we manage diseases. And MAT is a management of disease. We talked about that. Low, you don't say that COPD, coronary artery disease, or stroke is failed by it. Uh, we just, they're better managed on it. 
And then choosing the medications, that's a tough one. Um, patient choice, there are tools out there to determine which is the most appropriate medication, but I hope just through discussing this, you understand sort of a better basis for why they have these tools and patient choice, risk of diversion, affordability. I mean, now I think you're sort of empowered to make those decisions a bit better. Uh, I'm not into changing between meds, and I actually have this endorsement even from Operation PAR. They're kind of like, well, this doesn't happen very often, uh, and in the sake of time, we're just going to continue moving through. And these I are think, some. Of I think for the sake, I mean, we're we're already five minutes over. Yeah. Yep. So I think we'll. So, um, so I want to thank you both. Um, you did a really great job. <laughs> and, and I and I think what's really important. And if you remember the slides earlier today, you just look at the, the number of increase in using medications. Again, methadone's limited, so we can't do much about that. But using buprenorphine and certainly using naltrexone. So what you've got is a, um, you, you now have options that weren't available just, um, four years ago, three years ago. And we now have knowledge that wasn't as readily available three or four years ago. And we're now practicing at a much higher level in terms of treating these patients. And I think that's the remarkable part. And think about it, we have doctors who are on our team who are going around helping us understand on how to uh, effectively utilize these medications. And so, I think the most important thing to close this session is these medications are about a patient and where a patient's at and what a patient wants and a physician and what a physician understands and uh, works with those respective patients. And we, the providers, have to figure out how do we inside the environment we have and the requirements we have. How do we make all of that work? How do we drive patient-centered care that looks at all of these factors and say, what is the right medication, the right dose, the right complements? And if they're being, uh, they don't want this, they don't want that, are we gonna say, well, we're gonna deny you this, the medication, because you won't do this? I think those are really very, very important questions. And I think you get seeing some data and some validation that maybe that's not best practice.